What's happening, everyone? This episode of the podcast is sponsored by 101CBD.org. Now, in case you haven't heard, raw CBD is just CBD oil that hasn't been heated up or decarboxylated. And it turns out that our bodies absorb and hang on to that raw CBD oil a little bit easier than decarboxylated. And when I'm looking for CBD products, I want the cleanest and most effective ones that I can find. That's why I use the ones from 101CBD.org. Now, right now, I'm taking their Alleviate tincture. And I also went over and picked up some of their Raw Relief CBD topical. Now, because their CBD oil comes from hemp, it can be shipped discreetly anywhere in the U.S. and worldwide without any fear of it getting held up in customs. So go over to 101CBD.org and take a look at their products and pick yourself up some CBD. And at checkout, use coupon code IMGS25 for 25% off of your order. Now, 101 CBD also wants you to remember Saturday, June 29th, 2019, they're going to be hosting a raw CBD festival at Pier Shoals Beach in Ventura, California from noon to 5. And they want you to come out for a day of fun, raw CBD, hemp shakes, music, laughter, waves, food, and refreshments to celebrate the raw CBD movement. And get this, dogs are going to be the featured guest at this thing because there will be free samples of bacon CBD in preparation for the fireworks for the 4th of July because some dogs do get kind of skittish when they hear them go off. So don't forget, Saturday, June 29th, Pier Shoal Beach in Ventura, noon to 5. Now, if you're a cultivator or a home grower, you can find out the sex of your plant four times faster when you use the plant DNA sex testing kit from Delta Leaf Labs. They make it really easy to take a sample from your plant. And you send that sample in, and a few days after they get it, you'll know whether you've got a male or a female plant to work with. So go over to DeltaLeafLabs.com, order your plant DNA sex testing kits, and at checkout, use promo code IMGS10 to get 10% off of your order. All right, now let's get started. Well, hello again, everybody. Welcome back to the In My Grow Show, the podcast dedicated to taking the mystery out of cannabis. I'm your host, Alex, and this is show number 65. Now, before I get started, I just want to say one thing. You may hear a humming in the background. That's the air conditioner. I had to keep it on because it is hot as hell up here in Ojai. So if you hear that humming, that's what it is. A little later, I'm going to be talking about silica and why our plants need it. I'm also going to be talking just a little bit about social equity in the cannabis world. And <laughs> and I'm going to tell a story about uh, recording a podcast in Spanish. But first, let's get to the strain of the week. Today, I'm going to give it up to the raspberry cough. And I got to tell you, I love the way this stuff smells. I love the way this stuff smokes. It has a very fruity, flowery scent to it. And you know me, I like a fruity bud. And it is a cross between a Cambodian land race and the ice strain. Like I was saying, it does get me really high, but I'm still real clear-headed for the most part. Not something you want to share with somebody who's new to cannabis. But if you see it, I do recommend the raspberry cough to party with. Oh, that's a good one, man. That's a good one. I don't think I could do any work to it, though. Too heavy. Too heavy for work. But to party. Oh, yeah. All day long. Raspberry cough, folks. All right. So I've been trying to put together a cannabis podcast in Spanish and it hasn't been easy one because Spanish isn't like my day-to-day language that I speak and I was raised with Spanish in the house but I wouldn't call it my first language but I am pretty fluent in it right so I figured hey you know what I'm gonna give it a try I'm gonna put a podcast out in Spanish about cannabis and I thought a great place to start would be to do an episode about the endocannabinoid system and I invited my buddy Juan to come on the show and help me talk about it also. Shout out to Juan for uh, being brave enough to, to get out there with me. But I got to tell you, man, when we started out, well, a couple of things went wrong. First of all, we got way too high. I mean, we got high and then, and then hit record. Ooh, that was, a bad, that was a bad decision. Once again, you know, there's a reason why I uh, don't get really high and do the show because I can't function at that level and still do this. Does that make sense? Yeah, I can't get too high and get on the mic. I'll just, I'll dumb out. But anyways, the next thing I figured out was that the first episode of a podcast in Spanish 
the best place to start was not the endocannabinoid system. It, it was just a bit too technical for where I really was, you know. Once I started to try to speak the words, I was like, you know what? I need to go practice some more. So at, at any rate, we, we did wind up recording the first episode. I haven't edited, edited it together yet. And we just decided to have it be just an introductory episode and talking about the stigmas that exist in the Spanish-speaking culture around cannabis. So I thought that was a good place to start. Uh, <laughs> so I'm hoping to get that out in the next couple of weeks. I will let you know when it's finally up. So if you do speak Spanish or you know somebody who speaks Spanish and not too much English, you can send them that way to take a listen to what we have to say. And once again, please remember, we are not doctors. We're not lawyers. We're not plumbers. Not that that comes up, but, you know, just throwing it in there. So, yeah, keep an ear out. I should have it put together and out in a couple of weeks. All right, now moving on to what's going on in the social media world on my side. Once again, Happy Tree Art Class 805. Their next Puff and Paint is going to be on June 23rd. And this time, there will be an official food vendor. It is going to be Mayan Cuisine from a catering company named Sian Ka'an. I think I pronounced that right. It's actually the person catering it is my buddy Juan that got on the mic with me with the Spanish uh, episode. But you know what? I had some, some of his food. It was great. It was fantastic. It was delicious. It was a type of he... Okay, let me see if I don't screw this up. The name of what he fed me was panuchas. I think that's how you say it. Which is very close to a vulgar word in Spanish. But anyways, it's um, it looks like a tostada, but a little different. You gotta check it out. But back to Happy Trees. That's gonna be June 23rd, Sunday. Okay, the smoke session starts at 420. Art class starts at 6. And brothers and sisters, it is only 20 bucks. It is a hell of a bargain, a really great time. And some of the proceeds go to local charities. So you feel good all around. If you want more information about tickets, go to Instagram. You can find them at Happy Tree Art Class 805. More than likely, it's very, very possible. Very, very, very possible. I'm going to be there for that one again because I had fun the last time. The next thing I want to mention is... <laughs> this thing a friend of mine made me aware of called California Sober. Now, shout out to Kristen at SBVerde.com for, you know, putting this up. So apparently there's a movement called California Sober that I, I don't know if it's a label that people want to have where it's for people who only smoke weed and do natural psychedelics like, you know, San Pedro cactus or psilocybin mushrooms Stuff like that. And I had to laugh because, come on, man, really? You're going to put the word sober behind both of those things? Because that's not being sober on any level, you know? Come on. If I'm impaired, fucked up, either too high or way too, like, psychedelic, then, yeah, I'm not sober. You know, far from it. So then I started to wonder, well, why does somebody need a label like that? To make themselves feel better about being fucked up? That, yeah, I'm fucked up, but I'm not associated with those other people who are fucked up in a different way. I don't know. But yeah, dig it, man. California Sober. That's somebody's idea out there. All right, so let's move on to the report from the Cannabis Front Line. All right, let me see if I get this right. Governor Steve Sazol... Governor Steve Sazolik... Ooh, barely. ...of Nevada signed legislation into law that prohibits certain employers from refusing to hire workers because he or she tested positive for cannabis, as well as legislation encouraging financial institutions to work with licensed marijuana businesses and to process financial transactions and separate legislation to allow industrial hemp production. While Governor Sizolak was busy in Nevada, good for him, they're doing a lot of cool things out there in Nevada for cannabis, actually. Also, Governor Kate Brown of Oregon signed legislation into law that prohibits landlords from arbitrarily refusing to provide housing access to an individual based solely on their status as a medical cannabis patient or based solely on an individual's prior cannabis conviction. And Governor John Bell Edwards of Louisiana signed legislation into law to allow production of industrial hemp and hemp-derived CBD products. Well, it looks like a lot of hemp is about to start to be grown in Louisiana, guys. So uh, prepare yourselves. And get on it. And grow some of that hemp. I'm not kidding. It's a lot of fun. Next, I want to talk about something the Bureau of Cannabis Control of the great state of California put up. And that is, it's like a database of the frequently asked questions about cannabis use in California. 
you can go through and look up different topics. You know, one is adult use or cannabis events, CBD, industrial hemp. Of course, the one I clicked on was cultivation. So you click on that. And one of the questions that they highlight says, can I sell excess cannabis that I have personally cultivated at home? The answer to that is no. A license from the Bureau of Cannabis Control is required to sell cannabis. Persons 21 years of age or older can give away up to 28.5 grams of cannabis and up to 8 grams of concentrated cannabis to a person of, eight, of 21 years of age or older per day, but cannot receive money or any other compensation for it. So I can give away up to 28.5 grams a day. Not just to one person, but to anybody, anybody over 21. And up to 8 grams of concentrate a day. But I can't get paid for it. Now this sounds a lot like what was going on in Washington, D.C. where cannabis was legal, but there were no legal places to buy it. So people got creative and they started selling pencils for like 50 bucks. But when you buy a pencil, you get a free eighth of weed. That sounds like one of those loopholes. Somebody should try that out. And then let me know how that goes. I mean, does the law come down on you? Is that defensible? Can you defend that, in other words? I don't know. No idea. Now, next is an article that I found at Marijuana Business Daily, and it was written by Joey Peña and Maggie Cowie. I think that's how you pronounce it. C-O-W-E-E. I think that's Cowie. But the title says, Comparing the Prices Per Milligram of THC in Cannabis-Infused Products. It starts off, makers of marijuana-infused products can set competitive prices for their edibles, beverages, tinctures, topicals, capsules, or some linguals by looking at the average price per milligram of THC in those products in various markets. Data that shows the average price per milligram of THC can provide some insight for what consumers are willing to pay for those products in new and mature marijuana markets. And then it has a graph on it. And basically what it's showing is what customers are willing to pay per milligram of THC in different products. Like for instance, beverages in California were willing to pay 27 cents, whereas in Colorado people are willing to pay 25 cents of THC in their beverages. Uh, If we go over to edibles in California, we're willing to pay 17 cents per milligram. On the high side of that, Nevada, people out there, and that makes sense, I guess, right? They've got Vegas there. They're willing to pay 23 cents. So I guess it's a pretty cool resource if you're making anything that has concentrates in it, right? Because that way you know how to price your product, I guess, per milligram. But that also explains why a lot of products and dispensaries are expensive. So if you get a chance, you know, click on the link in the show notes and uh, take a look at this. It's pretty interesting. And that, brothers and sisters is the report from the Cannabis Frontline. And now I want to talk a little bit about silica and our cannabis plant and why it's needed. First of all, silicone makes up about 32% of the Earth's crust. There are different types of silica though. The one that the cannabis plant and most plants take up really easily is potassium silicate. So when you hear me talking about silica, that's what I'm talking about is the potassium silicate. Now, the plant needs silica because it's going to help strengthen the cell walls from the inside out. And when those plant cells are strong, that means that the branches are going to be stronger, the stems are going to be stronger. And since those branches are going to be stronger, we're going to be able to use less support, like, you know, those bamboo stakes. We're going to need less of those to hold up those heavy buds, you know, because the plant's going to be nice and strong and it's going to be able to hold hold that up for itself. Another thing that thicker stalks and stems is going to do is it's going to help transport water and nutrients it's also going to help the plant absorb it easier another way that silica is going to help is that the plant's going to be able to handle temperature fluctuations better you know really hot days and really cold early mornings or cold nights that kind of thing is going to stress the plant out less when it does have enough silica in it and it's going to help the plant be more drought resistant and once again go through less shock when you do have those high heat periods of the day So that's why I like to add silica, if not every watering, every other watering, because it really does help my garden just stay healthy. Silica is also going to help with any kind of pathogens or infections because, once again, with those stronger cell walls, it's going to be more robust. It's going to be able to fend off pathogens easier. And once again, talking about those, you know, strengthened cell walls, it's also going to make the plant stronger in the sense that 
it's going to make it harder for pests to be able to chew into the plant, whether it's the stems or the stalks or the leaves. You know, it's because they're going to be, you know, because they're going to be reinforced. They're going to be fortified, and that's what silica does. It helps the plant get stronger, get healthier. I give my plant silica in two different ways. I will add it in the watering, but I'll also foliar feed it. I'll use a spray bottle and spray it on the leaves. And I make sure to do this not when the plant is getting direct light or direct sunlight because that could cause a whole other type of problems that can cause burning on the plant because the droplets can act like magnifying glasses and just put these little burnt spots all over your plant if you do it with the lights on or in direct sunlight. So I just make sure that they're in the shade at the very least or the lights are off. Now you know how I was talking about that silica will help plants absorb nutrients. It's going to help the absorption of zinc. It's going to help the absorption of nitrogen, and it's also going to help the absorption of phosphorus. Not just help the absorption of phosphorus, but kind of balance it to make sure that the plant's not going to absorb too much. That's one of the jobs that silica has. Now, another thing that it's going to do is that it's going to compete with some metals to be absorbed by the plant. So think of it like this. If there's plant-available silica in the soil, our plants are going to absorb that. Okay, but if there's more heavy metals in the soil than silica, the plant's going to absorb the heavy metals instead. And those heavy metals are just going to, you know, wind up in the bud, wind up in our concentrates, wind up everywhere in the plant. That's another reason why we want to make sure our plants are getting enough silica. We want them to, you know, basically push out of the way those heavy metals that want to get into our plant. Now, as I was saying earlier, potassium silicate is the silicone that we want for our plants. There's sodium silicate, which can cause a huge problem because it has sodium in it, salt. Salt's not good for the plants. And when your plant gets too much salt, it can get what's called plant salt stress. Basically, your, your plant's going to slow down, you can have smaller yields, and it's just going to look stressed and sad. And that's going to be one of the reasons is because of the salt buildup. The other kind you don't want for your plant is the lithium silicate, because that could also cause a different type of toxicity. And those are just a few notes that I jotted down for potassium silicate. Now, the last thing I want to talk about today is social equity in the cannabis world. And I gotta be honest with you, I have no idea what that means. I don't know what social equity means. I've been on this kick for a couple of weeks of trying to figure out what exactly that is. I'm still learning, still don't know exactly what it is. I'm getting a better picture of it. I've been talking to a few people and I am gonna be having those kinds of conversations on the show also about what social equity is and what it looks like and how we can have it in the cannabis industry. And like I was saying, I've been looking up what it means and what I figured out is that it's a really broad subject and that it can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people de depending on what they're talking about. And while I was on the internet looking for something that'll help clarify or crystallize that idea of social equity, especially social equity in the cannabis, I ran across something that put it a little bit sharper into focus, or at least made it less fuzzy. And it comes from the Annie E. Casey Foundation. It is the Race Equality and Inclusion Action Guide. And here's what it helped me understand. Equity isn't the same as diversity, because diversity is the numerical representation of a different type of people. Okay. It also distinguishes equity from inclusion, which is the action or state of including or being included within a group or structure. Inclusion involves an authentic and empowered participation and a true sense of belonging. Equity is also different from equality, in which everyone has the same amount of something, food, medicine, opportunity, whether you need it or not. In other words, whether you're two feet tall or six feet tall, you still get a five foot ladder to reach a 10 foot platform. That's equality. Now, something else I found that I wanted to read, it comes from the National Academy of Public Administration. And it says, social equity is the fair, just, and equitable management of all institutions serving the public directly or by contract. And it is committed to promoting fairness, justice, and equity in the formation of, in the formation of public policies. Social equity is not based on treating all persons or communities the same. Instead, it is giving the same opportunities to all. And though there may be an imbalance in who can receive those benefits, for example, social or economic conditions, it is there for equitable distribution. So like I said, this stuff didn't exactly tell me what social equity was, but it did make it less fuzzy for me. Because I truly do believe that as cannabis goes legal across the country, we need to seriously talk about 
how we're going to reintroduce the people that have caught a cannabis conviction because of prohibition. You know, we need to make that right for them. You know, we need to be able to have them be part of that economy, of that industry. You know, because it really does seem like a rigged game. If we're going to put people in jail when cannabis was illegal and then legalize cannabis and allow a whole industry to grow and thrive, but don't let the people who caught a cannabis conviction participate in that legal market. We have to correct that. We have to change that. So yeah, man, that's going to be one of the things I'm going to be looking into. Well, brothers and sisters, guess what? I've come to the end of my notes. That's all I have for you today. Short and sweet. Now remember, if you have a question or a comment about this episode, reach out to me. You can find me on Instagram at InMyGrow. You can find me on Cannabuzz. Just look for Alex Robles. Or you, or you can send me an email that is InMyGrow at gmail.com. And don't forget, if this episode has educated you, entertained you, or even given you a little escape from your day or just something to think about, go over to patreon.com slash inmygrowshow and leave a financial donation. If you don't want to leave a donation, go over to inmygrow.com, click on the support the show tab and buy a t-shirt. Or before you go over to Amazon, click on the Amazon link in the bottom of the show notes. That way they know that we sent you and we get a commission. Now those funds just help me keep the show going. They help me pay for different hosting fees. They help me buy equipment. Now, if you can't support the show financially, that's okay. Don't worry about it. Here's how you can help, though. Subscribe to the website, subscribe to the podcast, and then tell three other people about the show. Really easy. Well, mis amigos, that is the end. So I'm going to get out of here and probably jump in the pool because, like I said, it's hot as hell out here. Remember that I love you all very much. And to always grow, learn, and teach. <laughs>